All right, uh, let's get started. Um, a couple things. So I really don't have any, you know, uh, substantially new announcements. We're sort of trucking along. So homework six is still due on Friday. I'm going to have that uh, a box outside my office. Just throw it in. We're not going to have class on Friday because I don't think we're going to have any snow between now and then. So I'm I'm going to going to hold to that. Just drop it off in the box outside my office. Uh, and we should be good. Um, exam number two, uh, number two is not going to be till after break. I've got it tentatively scheduled for Wednesday, April 5th. As far as I know, everything will still work out uh, for that. Our topics are going to be shear and deflections, which we should cover uh, the broad strokes of that uh, between now and then. So today I want to get back into shear. I want to get back into our example. And hopefully I think we can call it on shear today and maybe even get into a little bit of uh, deflections. So with that, uh, let me go ahead and just sort of get back into it. So if you recall, last time we had left, we were discussing that example. So uh, specifically, we were looking at, um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so we were looking at uh, a beam that instead of having just a uniformly distributed load, what made this beam more complicated was the fact that there were two point loads. So it caused uh, jumps in the shear diagram. And we, we sort of roughed out a shear diagram but what I'm really interested in is defining some equations and getting some more concrete values. Ha <laughs> no pun intended. Do you like that? Um, so, uh, yeah, that was actually pun intended there. Um, you're cracking up. Good. Um, so uh, what I, what I want to do is define some equations for that, get some more uh, clear points set up, and then uh, sort of knock out this... Uh, uh, some associated stuff with this example. So let's sort of let's sort of get to it. Now, last time, if you recall, we had um, looked at some beam parameters, and we started to construct our shear diagram, and that's about where we uh, where we left off. Sound good? Okay. Now I want to take a look at this shear diagram because I want to look at the uh, the lines that were uh, that were generated. Now um, I'm going to annotate these. I'm going to annotate this as line one and line two. Specifically, I'm talking about these sloped diagonal lines going down. I'm not talking about this. Okay? <clears throat> now, these are the equations of a line, right? Y equals mx plus b. Sound good? Now, if you're looking at a shear diagram, essentially this is your x-axis and this is your y-axis. Okay? So let's look at equation one. What is your y-axis intercept for equation one? 68. So if I look at equation one, I'll say B is 68 kips. Everybody okay with that? Everybody okay with that? Now the slope of that line, I propose it's negative four kips per foot. Now where am I getting that? The load. So I would say that the equation for region 1 is 68 kip, hold on, I can do better than that, that's bugging, bugging, 68 kips minus 4 kips per foot times x. Instead of going through and cutting a section and summing moments, we can just keep it simple. Everybody all right with that? Any questions? Now, that is equation number one. Now, equation number two, okay? Now, watch this. This diagonal line goes from 24 to 0 right here, right? And see how it does that in what? Six feet? Does everybody see that? My question is, if I took this diagonal line and I sort of trailed it up. Can anybody tell me what the intercept right here would be? 48. So here B is 48 kips and M is minus 4 kips per foot. So VU of X is 48 kips minus 4 kip per foot times x. Everybody okay with that? 
Now, if you're wondering how that works out from a plotting standpoint, just, uh, just bear with me. I'll show you something real quick. So we'll say, oh, we'll say X, no, we'll say X and B and V in tips. All right, so I'm going to do 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, but then I'm going to repeat 6 because that's where that point load is. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay. Now for everything from 0 to 6, I'm, what I'm saying is that the equation is 68 minus 4 times x. Is that what we said? Okay. And that equation will hold true up until about right here. And then right here, it's what? 48 minus 4x? Is that what you said? 48 minus 4, 4 times that. And then sort of drag that down. And if you highlight it all and then insert, if it cell will load, um, a scatter plot. You know, there's your shear diagram. So, you know, we drop down, we have our jump. Our jump is because we have two different equations, and then we go down. <clears throat> Everybody okay with that? Not too bad, right? Pretty simple? Okay. Okay. Now, just like last time, in order to appropriately construct our shear diagram, and when I say construct our shear diagram, I mean define all the given regions and do all that. We lay out our stirrups, or in other words, we determine where we need stirrups as a function of how much our concrete can hold up, right? So we need to, we need to take some uh, stock into that. So let's, um, let's go ahead and let's look at our concrete capacity. Okay, so first thing we need to uh, compute is the capacity that is provided by the concrete. So what is the shear capacity provided by the concrete? There we go. So V sub C is 2 lambda B sub W D square root of FC prime. So help me out. Uh, what's lambda for this problem going to be? One, because it's normal weight concrete. Now what's B? Ten inches. Remember, ten inches. Always write that stuff out. D is, what's that distance? Twenty inches. There you go. And the square root of what? Three thousand. There you go. Three thousand what? Remember, you put in PSI and you get out PSI. So what do we get right here? We'll just go to the nearest pound just to keep it simple. Anybody? So we'll just say 909. And that is what? Pounds. Do I have a second on that? All right. Or if I want, I could say 21.909 kips. Now that is VC. Tell me, how do I compute phi VC? What's phi? 0.75. So 0 0.75 times 21.909 kips which is what? So we'll say what? what let's, let's carry it 4, 3. I'm going I'm to be particular and do one more. Yeah. Everybody okay with this? Now can anybody remember one more value that I should go ahead and compute right now? Half of VVC, exactly. 
Bless you. So one half of VVC is one half of 16.432, and I'm going to say that's 8.216. Sound good? Do you like that? All right. Now, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back a little bit because I want to write something on uh, these two equations right here because I need to get a little mathematical. Okay? Would you agree that this first equation right here is going to be valid from 0 feet to 6 feet and this equation is going to be valid from 6 feet to 12 feet. I mean, actually, this, this second equation is going to be valid for a lot longer. I mean, actually, it would work all the way up until what, 18. But we don't really care. We only need to plot up until mid-span because since everything's symmetric, we'll just, you know, keep the, uh, the uh, whatever we design on one end of the beam, we'll just mirror it. Everybody okay with that? Okay, now, so here's the point I'm making, okay? If you recall, there were three values that we computed right off the bat before we started plotting. One of them was VU star, okay? VU star was the shear D away from the support. Remember that? Remember we cut off the shear diagram a little bit up top? My, my question to you, which equation am I going to use, number one or number two? Number one, there you go. Okay. Okay, so I'll say important values. All right, so VU star is VU at X equals D, which is going to be what? So it's 68 kips minus 4 kips per foot times what's D? Anybody got a problem with that? There you go. Everybody okay with that? What do we got? 61.333 or something like that? Okay. Let me explain what we just did. Okay. So here's my Excel plot. Um, in order to view this a little bigger, um, I'm going to right click, move chart to a new sheet so that it's, uh, it's a little bigger, a little easier to see. Okay, so what we did is let me uh, let me add some axis titles. So this is whoa, goodness. This is the distance along the beam, and it's in feet. Okay, now you're telling me d away from the support is 20 inches, right? So 20 inches is how many feet? One, one and some change. So one and some change is about right here. About right there. And so what value is that on the shear diagram? Well, it's about 61.33. You, you see what I'm doing? So does everybody kind of see that? Th that's kind of the idea. So I, I'm actually going to refer back to that a little bit because I, I want that uh, for clarity's sake. Now, we're going to need two more values. We're going to need X at VVC and we're going to need an X at half of VVC. Now, let me ask you a question. What is, uh, so what's VVC and half of VVC? It's like what, about 16 kips and about 8 kips? Let me ask you a question. Which equation should I use 
to determine that? Should I use equation number one or equation number two? To determine where the x is. Number two. number two, exactly. Yeah, here's here's my shear diagram, and what I'm trying to find is if phi v c is like 16 something, right? So I want to find if 16 is about right there. Okay, that's not going to work. So essentially, if 16 is right here and I drag that out, I need, I'm probably looking for something about right here, right? Everybody kind of see that? So it's probably going to be somewhere between, just eyeballing it, somewhere between 6 feet and 8 feet. That make sense? Okay, all right. So let's look at our equation. So how would I take equation number 2, which is right here, how would I take this equation and solve for x? Well, I can bring that over, right? So VU minus 48, change the sign, so 48 minus VU and divide by 4. Does everybody see that? Everybody with me on that? So what I'm saying is this. I'm saying it's going to be 48 kits minus VVC over four kips per foot. So 48 kips minus VVC, which is 16.432, divided by four kips per foot. And what do we get when we uh, chug that out? Seven point eight nine two what? Feet. All right, so 7.892 feet. Uh, first off, do I have a second on that value? Okay. Uh, all right. Second, does that value make sense? I mean, didn't we say, just looking at the chart, it should be somewhere between about 6 and 8, just looking at the lines? So does that value make sense? Now, since we're talking about stirrup spacing, let's go ahead and convert that to inches and get... So 94, we'll say 94.7 inches. 94.7, goodness, I'm a little bit. Okay, everybody okay on that? So if I used equation two to solve for this one, I'm certainly going to use it for this one down here. So the same deal, so we'll say 48 kips minus half of phi v c over 4 kips per foot, which is 48 kips minus 8.216, 4 kips per foot. And somebody want to tell me what that is? 9 point, we'll just keep that, 9.95 feet, which is how many inches? <coughs> Bless you. All right, sound good? Okay, so let's actually draft out our shear diagram, and I'm not using that straight line tool thing because, yeah, I'm not going to waste time with that. Has everybody got this? Okay, so, yeah, it's, it's that one. Example 14. Okay, so let's see. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm actually going to, I'm going to take this, I'm going to move it over a little bit. Okay. So on the x-axis, this is x. I'm going to plot this in inches. And then on the y-axis, we're going to have a shear value. And I'm going to put a factored shear so, so that we know that we're dealing with factored loads. And this is in kips. Okay. Now, <coughs> Now the actual shear diagram is going to do something about like this. It's going to drop down. We're going to have a jump. And it's going to go down something about like that. Okay. <laughs> now right here, it's 
that is the center line for the beam. So I guess I don't really need all this out here. So I can just say like that. Okay. Now to put some values on this, this is 44. This is 24. Now this is 68. But we actually don't really use that, right? Because remember we cut off our shear diagram. Our actual shear diagram looks something about like this. And really what we should have is it should do something about like that, right? Now that cutoff is at VU star. That's our initial starting point and that was 61.33. Is that what we said? Okay. And that cutoff right here And that is 20 inches, we said? Okay. So that makes this value at center line, what's the value at center line? What's the x value right here? 144, because it's a 12 foot, uh, it's a 24 foot long beam, so the center line is 12 foot, so this is 144 inches. Okay. Everybody good with that? Now, We've got, okay, so another thing, because it's going to be important, where is that? Where's the jump? What X value? 72 inches. That's going to be important, okay? Now, we've got two more values that are worth mentioning. We've got PVC and half of PVC. Now, PVC is what, 16.43, something like that? So that's going to be about right here. So I'm actually going to use red dash lines for that. So we'll say that's about right here. And half of VVC is going to be something about like that. So let's start off with the X values. The X values are 94.7 and this is 119.4, right? And then this And then this is about like that. So this is PVC is I'll put a kip, 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 kip. So PVC was sixteen point forty-three and half of PVC is eight point two two. Is everybody with me on this so far? This isn't to, uh, too bad, is it? Pretty straightforward stuff. Okay. Now let's let's recall a couple things. Okay. So let's start off with something simple. Okay. This is half a PVC, right? And that's about right here. What can you tell me about the region of the beam between here and here? What what's what's going on here? We don't need any stirrups here at all. So. If I want to start defining a couple things, this region, no stirrups, right? Okay. What's that? Because the shears in this particular region are quite low. I mean, like right here, this is a shear of only about two kips. Anytime the shear is less than half a PVC, you don't need stirrups at all. Okay? Now this region's a little more tricky because anytime that the shear is less than this value, we technically don't need stirrups because the concrete takes over. However, in this particular region, the code dictates, I don't really care, you're still putting stirrups there. So we call this region the region where the concrete carries the shear, but really we want to be doing our best to use S maximum right there. So we'll call this concrete carries shear. Really the, the where the, the business is happening is in here. This is where we got to provide stirrups for structural capacity. So stirrups needed.
But long and short of it, when we start laying it out, we're going to place stirrups. from x equals 0 to x equals 119.4. OK. Does that sound good? Everybody OK with that? Think, before we move on, this is something we really need to think about or need to keep in the back of our head is this. We have a jump, a jump from 44 kips to 24 kips right here at x equals 72. Okay, you need to think about that. Okay, just keep that in the back of your head. But other than that, does anybody have any questions about this? Pretty simple. Not too bad, right? Okay. All right, so if you've got your shear diagram, then everything else gets a little rote uh, from there, okay? <coughs> so can I move on, or has everybody got this? No? Are you move on? Okay, okay. All right, so... Okay. So I'm going to try and, and, and sort of treat this problem like it's a, a traditional one that you would see on a, uh, maybe a homework or an exam or something like that. So let's just, we'll just sort of carry it all the way through. So the next thing, so the first thing we need to do, or the next thing in our problem and the first thing for design, is we need to figure out what our starting S value needs to be. So our starting S value, remember when we start our design, we're starting our design based off of the region that has really, really high shear values, right? So the code allows us to in, uh, in reduce that shear a little bit, so we're designing for essentially for VU star. So let's figure out our first stirrup spacing. So S required. And th remember, there wasn't any magic into this equation. It's just taking PhiVN's got to be greater than or equal to VU and solving for S. That's really all we've got. So this is phi times uh, AV. Whoop, I can get that in there. AV FY or FYT D divided by VU star minus VVC. So we know what VVC is. VS is AV times FY times D over S. The sum of those has got to be greater than or equal to VU. Solve for S. That's all this equation is. So let's start plugging and chugging. So what's V? There we go. All right. Um, what is uh, AV? There we go, inches squared. What's FY? And D. There we go. Now what was VU star? So we'll just say you know, 3, 3 or 3, 3, 3. I don't think it's really going to matter. Now VVC. 4, 3, 2, so, uh, yeah, it's not really going to matter what we do, so 4, we'll say 4, 3. Now, if I plug and chug, what do I get? 4.41. Do I have a second on that? Okay. Now, if you're telling the contractor to space that out, what are you going to tell them? Okay, so our first stirrup increment is going to be use S equals 4 inches. Yes? After the first one. Yeah, yeah. You typically use either two, 
uh, half of that, which it also is two, maybe three, but that's just to get started. That's very typical. Everybody okay with that? All right. Now, um, what I'm going to do on this problem is I'm going to use two increments of stirrup spacing. I'm going to use this, which is four inches, and then I'm also going to use the maximum stirrup spacing. I mean, we obviously have a region where we don't need to use all, yes, sir. Okay. All right. Think about it like this. All right. We're in design mode. Okay. So let me ask you this. What do you think is stronger? Okay. Four inch spacing or six inch spacing? Yeah. We're talking, yeah, th where the stirrup spacing is, to be conservative, you round down. Yeah. Make sense? All right. Everybody else okay with that? Okay. Now, we're also going to need to find a maximum. S value. So in order to find a maximum S value, we're going to need to figure out S max 1 and S max 2. Y'all remember that? So I'm going to make y'all do a little bit of work. I'm going to make you all go through your notes and tell me what S max 1 and S max 2 are. Okay, that's Minimum of, right? Now somebody else is telling me the other one. Well, let, let's get through this one. Minimum of, what's that? Now you all were on it. Okay, so the minimum of D over 2 and D is 20 inches, so the minimum of 20 inches over 2 or 24 inches. So that's 10, right? Sound good? All right, now S max 2, we got to figure out a couple of things. The first thing we've got to figure out is 0 0.75 times the square root of FC prime, which is 0 0.75 times the square root of what? There we go. 3,000. All right. Why is that important? Because our denominator has a maximum term. It's either the maximum of that or 50, so we're going to use 50, right? Okay. So S max 2 is computed as what was it? AV over or AV times FY divided by the quantity BW times 50, right? So So BW, 50 PSI. So this is, AV is 0.22. Then we've got what, uh, 60? It is 60 KSI for the problem, right? And B sub W, what was B sub W again? 10 inches and 50. PSI. So what does that come out to be? Ah, there you go. I like it. See, there's the benefit of putting those units down. Oh. You, uh, you saw it though, right? So you're learning something, which means I'm doing good. If you learned something, then I did my job. What do we got? All right, is, uh, do I have a second on that? Okay, so we got two values to choose from, that one and that one, so what am I going to do? Use the smallest, that one. You can go with this, or you can do with that. <laughs> Bringing it back to, you know, early 1990s. Okay. All right. 
So everybody with me on this so far? OK, so let's walk through this, this process, and let's make sure everybody's clear on this. So we've got two increments of stirrup spacing that we're going to use. We're going to use S equals 4 inches and S equals 10 inches, right? So let's make sure we're clear on, on, on how we go about doing that. So we start off with an increment of 2 inches, right? Then we're going to use 4 inches until the 10 inches can take over, right? So probably, probably what we need to do is figure out when can we start using S equals 10 inches. Everybody with me on that? So, well, we're, no, we're just going to carry it out. We're just going to carry it out and do this one. So let, let's do this. And, you, and you'll see where I'm going with, here, with this here in a second. Let's determine the range for S equals 10 inches. So in other words, if I give you an S value of 10 inches, can you compute a V sub S? Can you then compute a V VN? And then you can compute the X distance, right? The X quantity where you can start to use that stirrup increment. Does that make sense? All right, so, so bear with me. So V sub S is a v f y d over s which is what is a v there we go getting y'all trained up with the units f y is and d over s is So what does that come out to be? All right. Second on that? Okay. So next I can compute phi Vn, which is just phi Vc plus VVS. Now what's VVC? Sixteen point point four three kips plus now what's VVS? There you go. Want to make sure not to, like we didn't have to multiply this one by the 0.75 but we do on on the, the second term. So 0 0.75 Get ahead of myself. Uh, times 26.4 kips is what? Thirty-six point two three kips. Everybody so far so good? Now, let me ask you a question. Which equation am I going to use? Remember we're solving for x, right? So I have equation one and equation two. Which equation am I going to use to figure out where that occurs on the shear diagram? Neither of them. Why? It's on the line. Exactly. Okay. Here's our shear diagram. Here's our shear diagram. What's PVN? What did we just compute? 36. Where does that occur? It occurs right there. So I propose we can start using the 10 inch spacing right there. Does that make sense? The example that we did last time, when we were doing it step by step, we only had a single equation. It was just a straight line. So at that point, we took the equation, we plug and chugged, and we solved for x. What I want you to do is recognize what, what he just recognized. And he looked at the shear diagram and figured out where does 36 point something kips occurs. It was right there. You know, No equation necessary. x at PVN is 72 inches. That's what I'm interested in. Okay, and that's the, really one of the big reasons for this whole example. Like that's kind of uh, an important point of this whole example. Does that make sense? Okay, everybody, everybody okay with that? Good. So if you're okay with that, we can get into design right now. 
Okay. In fact, I might sort of squinch it on the bottom right here. Because we can write down everything that we need for our, for our design. So, we're going to um, start with one stirrup at two inches, right? Sound good? Then, what are we going to do? We're going to use four inch spacing until X equals what? 72. Then what? Until where? 100 what? No, nah, it'd be 119.4. Well, yeah, but we're going to have to go over a little bit. You, you're, you're, you are thinking a little ahead because you're thinking it's going to work out all evenly. You'll see what happens here in a second. So, All right. So let's sort of lay out our spacing right here. So the first thing we've got is one stirrup at two inches. So that's two inches, right? Okay. So our next stirrup spacing is at four inches. Now, now help me out. How many increments of stirrup spacing are we going to need um, to cross the, or at least reach or cross the threshold of 72 inches? 18, right? Because if we use 18, 18 times 4 is 72. And that will get us past this point because of that initial increment, we're at 74, right? Make sense? So um, this is at x equals 2. This will be at x equals 74. So we're at x equals 74, and we're using 10-inch spacing. So 84, 94, 104, 114, 124. So we're going to use 5. So 5 at 10 inches. So 18 plus 5 is 23, plus 1, 24 stirrups going to 124 inches, so, or 48 total. Any questions? That's not so bad. You could. Um, let me say this. If you go to your homework assignment, um, on your homework assignment, I'm basically saying only use two increments, the minimum or what is required at VU star and the maximum spacing altogether. And I'm doing that just to ensure that everybody arrives at the same answer. Now let me uh, respond to that also by saying, if you can do this, you can do it with another spacing. It's just more of the same stuff. So I'm really not concerned about that from a homework or an exam standpoint. Because if you can lay it out with ultimately three different increments, you can do four. And you can do five. So once you've got this, I think you, you understand the pattern. And from then on, it's busy work. So. Is everybody else okay with that? Any other questions? Anything at all? All right. I do want to at least begin discussing the topic of, um, of serviceability uh, before we leave. So let me close this. I don't need that. So <coughs> I want to get into this a little bit because 
Um, this is uh, an incredibly important topic for design, um, incredibly important topic for concrete altogether. Up until now, all we've been talking about is strength uh, considerations. In other words, how, how much rebar do we need to place in the beam so that it doesn't fail or that it doesn't crack or, 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 or lose its capacity to carry load. But there's a whole host of other types of considerations that we need to worry about in structural engineering. One of the big ones is serviceability. Um, strength limit states, or in other words, the stuff we've been talking about up until now, are intended to ensure that the structure is safe, okay, or that the structure, um, uh, ha, ha, uh, you know, isn't going to fall down and, and, and uh, represent a threat to, a, to, to, to human life. Serviceability considerations, however, are just trying to make sure that we, it doesn't deflect too much or it doesn't uh, crack too much, it doesn't vibrate too much uh, or, or, uh, or something like that. So it's not really about um, ensuring the beam's survival against a worst case scenario. It's more about um, just making sure the beam behaves like you want it to on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so one of the things that, um, that we will uh, enforce is because we're not worried about this from a safety standpoint and a guarding against failure standpoint, because that's not a concern, no load factors when we do deflections. No 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live because those load factors, we're increasing those loads to account for uncertainty against guarding against failure. We're not talking about failure here. We're just talking about day-to-day -day performance. Now, um, the reason it's important is because Nowadays, since we have newer and stronger materials uh, and things like that, we can get by with using more and more slender elements to safely resist loads. But the more slender an element gets, the less stiff it gets. Remember, it's moment of inertia is a function of how big the beam is. Moment of inertia goes down, deflections jump up. So we have to be able to control uh, deflections uh, with proper design. i got a couple minutes, and then, then we'll call it. Um, now... The thing, with, uh, uh, the thing with deflections, deflections are actually pretty easy to compute if you have CE312. I know your CE312 professor was just a horrible guy. You know, he's you know, a, a meanie, very insulting. I know he has bad jokes for one thing. Um, <laughs> um, but but uh, let me be clear that the actual com computation of deflections themselves are, are, are pretty straightforward. You know, if you have a simply supported beam, with a point load in the middle, you can calculate the deflection at mid-span as PL to the uh, third over 4080. Okay. Now E is pretty straightforward. E is just the modulus of elasticity of concrete. We can compute that very easily. The problem is I, the moment of inertia. That's a little tough. Here's why. Okay. So let's say I have a beam, and I've, let's say I've got a uniformly distributed load on it. So would you agree the moment diagram looks something about like this, right? Remember that whole cracking moment thing that we did a while back? Remember that? Well, if I look at the beam holistically, you know, the whole beam uh, uh, as, as one cohesive unit, here's the moment diagram. The cracking moment, let's say it's about right here. Well, if that's the case, would you agree that some of the beam's going to be cracked and some of it isn't? So from an analysis standpoint, this is really the beam we ought to be analyzing, right? Some of it's cracked and some of it isn't. So how do we handle that? Okay. Well, the way that we handle that is we use what's called an effective moment of inertia. And you can think of an effective moment of inertia as kind of a weighted average. Okay. Instead of using this or this, sort of a weighted average in between. Okay. It's a function of the cracking moment and the moments that are applied to the beam, you know, the dead loads and the live loads. But because this isn't a safety consideration, because we're not guarding against failure when we compute deflections, no load factors, okay? So I'm making that really clear right now. No load factors, okay? It's also going to be a function of your gross moment of inertia and then your cracked moment of inertia. Remember the transform section properties we did a while back? Well, they're starting to rear their ugly head again. So you need to know how to compute moments of inertia and you need to know how to compute those, uh, those cracking moments, okay? Now, um, the only other thing that I'll mention, and we'll get into this next time, is that um, uh, when we compute deflections in reinforced concrete beams, the, um, the, the order in which we compute those loads gets kind of tricky. See, 
uh, in the life of a beam, the first thing that we do is we put dead loads on it and it deflects. And then we put live loads on it. Okay. So in actuality, a beam never sees live load by itself. It always sees either dead load or dead plus live. But if you want the live load deflection by itself, because of the progression of cracking in concrete, what you've got to do is compute the dead load deflection and then the deflection due to the dead load plus the live load and subtract it out. And, and you would think, well, wouldn't, couldn't, well, can't you do that? Can't you still just do that? Well, no, because for each of these two deflections, because there's more cracking, there's a different moment of inertia for each count. So you can't just directly compute it. All right, sound good? All right, that's all I've got for today. Next time we are going to get um, really into this, and I really want to explore this deflection stuff before spring break. So that's all I've got. I will see you all on Wednesday. <coughs> Where's the sign-in sheet? <laughs>